Uh, David Cornish from uh, Ballarat. Uh, David, you, you sort of mentioned in one sentence you reduced your production costs by 80 per cent over 10 years and sort of just moved on. Um, I find that quite phenomenal given that it's an expanding business and all that. Is there any, you know, that would take a whole cultural change or a cultural focus on investment decision making, how you went about it. I've just, you know, a brief, what would be your guidance to people trying to do that in other businesses? Uh, well, in fact, getting down to 80 per cent was a big shock to me too. Um, so the, the biggest thing was the whole, the whole management team, right down to the guys on the floor, got behind the idea of what don't we have to do. It was a matter of not doing stuff. So um, uh, that was the biggest thing. We had surplus machinery because we'd, um, we'd gone through a few ups and downs in terms of um, seasonal demand for our products. So when you sort of uh, have excess machinery, you sort of say, well, what can we do better with that? So the biggest, single biggest step we did was putting the same volume through one machine rather than two, and that got us halfway home. Could I follow up? Uh, we hear a lot about the downturn in manufacturing in China, but also their labour cost rises and so on. How cost competitive equivalently, if you don't mind, is your Australian operation now to perhaps uh, an operation in China? Well, we can benchmark easily between Australia and China because we own two factories. Australia is currently cheaper. Isn't that a fascinating issue that you might not have thought of? Um, mm. As a, one of the things, perspectives you may not be aware of, we've got a major biosecurity challenge as an industry. If there's ever a foot and mouth disease outbreak, because the virus can survive in greasy wool, one of the best ways to disinfect is to scour. But there are very few scouring plants left in Australia. One of the great little ironies is um, that perhaps if you're set up right, one of the best places to scour could well be here. Call me. <laughs> There's a plug. Any other questions from the two our speakers? Yes. Andrew Johnson, uh, mixed farmer from Tidanara, South Australia. I enjoyed all your presentations, but uh, Jason and Buff, uh, and I'm pleased you brought up about the six months shearing because apart from ASBVs, uh, on a commercial sense, uh, it's something that we can do very easily. And I wonder, Jason, whether you'd uh, looking at as far as the productivity gains from that, you know, with better conditions. And then the second part to wall panels, wall people, one of the biggest limitations, I believe, in the sheep industry, I'm passionate about it, is we've lost capital. We've lost, over the last 20 years, lost the skill sets. And I, I do believe, and I've seen it in our area, father, farmers' sons have come back and possibly taken a lifestyle choice and wanted a tractor that drives itself. Um, infrastructure's gone, water points gone, fences are gone. Is that going to be one of the industry's biggest limitations? Yeah, um, I might, I'll be quick on the first one and I'll let Bull <laughs> answer the second one. Um, the six months shearing, I've got to be honest, um, the, the main thing that does is take a producer's wool goggles off. There's a big part of the year where so many breeding ewes out there we don't actually understand a true body condition. So is there a massive efficiency gain by shearing her twice? No, but you take the goggles off so you see her bare shorn, because from bare shorn to three months of wool, basically you can really understand where she's at. So instead of having six to nine months of the year where we can't see where she's at, I think that's the biggest thing. It drives people to, to focus on the used body condition score at least twice as regularly as what they were. So that's, that's the main outcome there. Um, on the mixed farming front, uh, Boff's experiencing that in his, his community, I'll let him add to that. But us as an industry, we're very conscious of that. There's, there has been displacement of a lot of sheep in the cereal sheep zone. And um, we are thinking about how we can better penetrate our messages into that situation. And maybe we need to get a bit more innovative in our, in our communication means how we, how we reach that mixed farmer because they can't devote the time to come to the same information exchange that we do. Uh, so, Wolf, do you want to have a go? Yeah, well, uh, I might just touch on both of them. There's a little bit different view than maybe than Jason uh, with the six month shearing. Um, I just found financially it's about a line baller. It had to be six months. It couldn't be eight months for me because I wanted to do away with the crutching, that labour and the time and effort. So it was either six months or nothing. So that's where those genetics came in. So I do away with crutching. You get about 10% more wool. So there is some efficiency off shears and sheep just 
do better off she is. And I'd love the research because I don't know whether anyone's actually put their finger on why. So. But everyone that runs sheep would know if they're lambs or whatever are doing too well, you shear them and they, and they get a bit of a kick along. So you get a bit of a kick there. So you get an extra 10%. So I reckon the extra 10% wool and the saving on the crutching financially covers the cost of the extra shearing. So you think, well, why would you do it? You must love being in a shearing shed. It's uh, the reasons that Jason said, but it's also I now join and shear that six to eight weeks off shears, and that is when sheep are just doing it their very, very best. They are just the healthiest. They lamb now instead of having nine months worth of wool on them, they've got two, six weeks or two. They, that's where a lot of the year mortality, if it's raining and wet and they've just gone through that lambing process and they try to get up and then they've got to produce colostrum and all the rest of it, take that extra weight off their backs. Like there's a lot of efficiency gains. They seem to produce more milk, they just seem to do a lot better off shears. So all the benefit, other the only financial benefit is your cash flow. You actually get your, half your wool money six months earlier, so it can offset debt or something instead of wandering around the paddock getting wet and weighing the sheep down and holding them back, you're actually, it's, it's working for you in the bank account or something. And one of the other well, things I'll just flag is that not many people realise the staple length measure, the staple strength measurement is biased by length. So as you go shorter, every 20 mil you go shorter, the staple strength goes up, I think, between four and eight. It's curvilinear. So, Buff, I would imagine you'd be getting up towards 50 newtons. 60. And okay, so strength, when you look at it, it's just about over the last 10 or 15 years, and I've tried to get this data more isolated, but uh, it's nearly a bigger determiner of price than micron. We know there's not much of a micron premium the there, so staple strength is a big determiner. Just to, to finish the, the discussion, the issue you, you got, the other one you raised, which um, I call farming easy, is a, is a massive one, because it's one of those things we can hear about, we talked about the profitability of the self-replacing marine enterprise, and, or which, whatever you describe it. I know myself, but there's a lot of farmer sons who can look at, there's a way of e earning that profit easy and there's a way that's earned hard. And the other way is, I don't think we as an industry measure our profit related to the man hours required to generate that profit enough. So certainly, I'll just flag as an investor in the R&D, there's a lot of interest in labour-saving technologies in the livestock industries. So dairy, MLA, um, AWI, we've got um, significant interest in that space. We've got two full-time staff members now in that space. And for the first time in our strap plan, we'll have a dedicated strategy for farm automation. Um, so it's a space to watch. It's a, it's, it really is a, we're playing catch-up, of course, against the cropping enterprises and so on. But um, unless we can tackle some of those things being able to mount a persuasive profit case will never be enough. So, Paul, I, I just wanted to quickly add for those in the audience that do have sheep and are going to go to pre lamb shearing, one thing that absolutely will happen in cold weather, our appetite will go up by about 30%. OK, so one of my reservations about pre lamb shearing, if it's not on a farm with measured and managed practices, the ewe will eat her head off and by the time she gets to the lambing paddock, there's no feed resource, and then Amy's work on that lambing environment will tell us that that compromises maternal behaviour and exacerbates lamb loss. So you've got to be careful about how you use some of these tools, OK? OK, look, we, we, there are some other people with questions. Can I ask you to go? Yeah, Nick McBride from uh, AJ and Pierre McBride, South Australia. Uh, first of all, uh, I'll start from real positive. I thought Caroline and David's presentations were really good, but I've got to be honest, I'm going to be a little bit uh, diplomatic and say I was disappointed with Jason and Andrew's presentation. And mainly reason is that we had no RIIs, return on investment figures given, we had no benchmarking figures given, and we had nothing to say that these practices that they were advocating were any beneficial to anyone in this room. So that the information is out there, the benchmarking figures are out there, and I know they've just got sources of, uh, let's say, strategies of running sheep. There are thousands of them out there in Australia right there today, and not every one of them are winners. So um, I, that's just a comment, and I appreciate the two other things, but I found it very frustrating to listen to the other two. The other thing about Andrew, sorry, Jason, you're right about the shearing. My understanding is that when you shear every six months, you do create the animal to be cold, you do up the ante on her appetite, and she does a lot better when you take the wool off. And, and your comments there, Jason, are absolutely correct. If you did it prior to lambing, you would absolutely make that hungry you eat more. Thank you. So I'll take the right of one response, because being a footballer, I sort of like to give a bit back after someone's had a crack, so that's OK. <laughs> um, 
So the benchmarking I was referring to you in there, and I talked about the 5% to 7% higher stocking rate and all that, I can show you exactly that on a gross margin return to asset basis. So there's, there's a full data set behind that. And then I was also talking about the ROI on an industry level and investment in some of these initiatives. So I'm more than happy to take that up with you, with you we'd, afterwards. We'd hoped to have a representative from a, one of the major corporate uh, producers here to talk about their actual real life situation. But unfortunately, they weren't permitted to present on behalf of the and, company. And to finalise that, the best practice data that was in there was linked to one of those and they make 7% return on assets on the property that is delivering exactly those outcomes that I described. So but there's plenty of depth in that area and maybe I take the point we should have included more of that. So I appreciate, yeah, appreciate many, the feedback. Many reasons to be disappointed with Jason's presentation and that was just one of them. <laughs> <laughs> are, there, are there any other questions from the, from the audience? Yes. Is there a microphone that can be... Oh, sorry. It's Mr Peart, yes. Uh, David, a quick question, and you might be able to solve this problem for me in about four or five words. The perceived wisdom that Caroline uh, trotted out that low oil prices make for cheap synthetics, but a manufacturer told me many years ago that the cost of boiling the water in the scouring process uses up a huge amount of energy and a drop in the oil prices is equal or a better benefit to uh, wool than it is to synthetics, true or false? Uh, really complex. Um, <laughs> uh, yes, we use, well, if I was using natural uh, methane to heat, the, heat my uh, scour bowls, then it would actually kill the argument completely. I'm, I'm not sure that, that it's necessarily a, a one for one with oil to synthetics. I think it's a bit more complicated than that. It comes down to the cuts of the, the oil barrel they want to take. So um, I'd have to say false because I just can't prove either way. But I will, Graham. I'm sure you'd be aware the there's like a 98% correlation between the price of the retail price of acrylic or polyester and the price of oil. You choose whatever benchmark you like. But the price of oil is no doubt a contributor to the cost of processing, but it's not such a major determinant on the price of the clean filament per se when you compare the raw wool costs. But maybe that's something we can come back to that's next year. That's a good year. question. I just can't pull the data quick enough, unfortunately. Okay, there's a, 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 a question. We might have to pull it up very shortly. Oh, sorry, there's, we'll, we'll take one from you and we'll take one from you, sir, and then we might have to, to pull it up. Go for it. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure whether this is a Dorothy Dixer or a devil's advocate thing, but I'm listening to what you say, having grown up in Hamilton on a wool farm and watching the whole area now becoming a, very much a wheat farming rather than a mixed farming. I'm wondering, does it really matter? The question down there was, how can we stop this or how can we adapt to it? Isn't just production itself the important thing and does it matter whether it's wool or does it matter whether it's wheat? What's the problem? Well, I've got a problem if there's no wool around. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a problem if there's no sheep around. So is he, because he sells rams. I've, okay. this, this is the fibre session, and I think we've all got a vested interest. <laughs> there's definitely that. Um, no, philosophically, uh, as long as producers who want to be on the land are making a fair return for the effort they're putting into producing whatever they've chosen to produce, there is no problem. Um, but since we're talking about sheep, uh, that's, <laughs> yeah. What, what I would say is, if you're talking about displacement of merino sheep, given that that's where I grew up, in sort of a 100k radius of Hamilton, as you know, um, the, you mentioned one pressure on merino sheep, and that's cropping in that district, but I don't think there'd be another shire with a higher rate of displacement of superfine merino ewes for composite ewes in this country. Um, so there's a lot of pressure on the merino industry in what used to be referred to as the wool capital of the world, and that's part of where the redesigning of the merino is, is, is evolving, because the sheep of yesteryear is perhaps not the same animal that's going to work in the future. So it's, it's in a real state of flux around Hamilton. It's a sure. bigger question than this forum, um, which I'm sure you appreciate. And um, I mean, I, I represent a, com a company, as you do, that exists for the, the common good, the national interest. And you could 
depending on the price of wheat at the moment, and a lot of blokes, for example, in WA are really struggling, for example, with the price of wheat, you would argue that um, it's probably in the national interest to have more sheep in those enterprises, and you probably certainly could in terms of the sustainability of the businesses, potentially um, herbicide resistance issues, blah, blah, blah. So it's quite a complex uh, issue that you've raised. Um, we so might Paul, just so you don't like sound like you're speaking on behalf of the sheep industry, Plant Farm has just done a big review on exactly that in the Eastern Wee Belt, and they concluded exactly that, the sustainability of the businesses uh, and the profit in the long run of the businesses that have got sheep and crop mixed is superior to those that are exclusively in stock, uh, in crop. Thank you. We might park that there for the moment and allow this gentleman the last. Can you introduce yourself too, please? Uh, my name is Kevin. I'm calling from, I'm from uh, Donghai, Australia. I got a question for uh, Mr. David. Uh, in, your, in your last slides, you mentioned like uh, in the future you're going to have uh, supply directly from the grower. And uh, I just have a general question. Like, uh, what's, what's the benefit for the grower and for, uh, for your company? And how you actually operate like this? grower is uh, not paying um, fees to take it to auction, uh, so that's a cost down for the grower. Um, for me, the way we operate is through dealers throughout Australia. Um, we offer pretty much cash on delivery, so it's a faster cash cycle as well. And if I can have a relationship with the grower and uh, talk to him again next season, I actually can then start planning forward. The challenge for me right now is to go and buy 3,000 bales a week at auction uh, when there's only 2,000 bales on offer, it's a bit tricky. So I actually need to have uh, my supply side built in, otherwise my costs will go through the roof and I'll be stopping my factory more often than I'm running it. Okay, well look, we might leave it there if you're comfortable with that answer. Um, can I thank you all for your attendance, your interest? Can I thank the speakers for their generally on-time presentations but the, <laughs> and the, the, the quality of discussion? That was fantastic. I'm sure Carolyn and I would like, we'd be, appreciate any feedback that you have on the nature of the session and any ideas you've got for next year. Um, and uh, can I also finish by again congratulating uh, Graham on his, his interest and uh, contribution to this forum. Uh, very disappointing, only one question this year, Graham. I know you've, anyway, look, thank you all and I wish you well.